President, fellows and guests. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and talk to you tonight. Um, I'm pleased to say that I'm Duncan Garrow, um, but you will also be getting mail um, for part for the second half, um, so we are doing hopefully not a comedy double act. Um, and we're going to be talking to you um, tonight um, about the project um, we're working on at the moment. Um, it's important to say at the outset that Mel and I are here tonight, but this is very much a, 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 a team um, of great goods researchers. It's nice to have heard Neil Wilkins' name mentioned just a little while ago as being elected in FSA today. I think that was what you were announcing. Um, along with Anne Wen and Trina, um, who have been, Mel, Mel will agree, I'm sure, have been doing a lot of the work so far. Um, this is a, um, an AHRC funded project. Um, it's 42 months long altogether. It started in September 2016, so we're two and a bit years into a three and a half year project. So while in some ways it doesn't seem early days, it also um, hopefully we can latch on to the idea that it's early days as well. Um, and we're looking um, at grave goods um, from the Neolithic to the end of the Iron Age on the project. Um, from right from the very start, um, we focused on the pun that is encapsulated in the the term grave goods, in that these are objects found in graves, but they're also objects that we feel need to be taken seriously at a variety of different levels and need to be taken into account in terms of the full range of grave goods that existed in the past. Um, so well, maybe some would argue that um, the gold cup in the middle there had received on the Iron Age mirror and those fancy things had re received a lot of attention. Perhaps the pots down the bottom left and even to an extent um, the copper dags down the bottom right have arguably received less attention and our point from the start of the project has been that the full spectrum of grave goods needs to be taken into account when we're talking about objects in death in late prehistoric Britain. The core questions of the project are listed up there as you can see. Um, the first um, is a dual question really, what do we mean by grave goods and also what did grave goods mean to people in the past? Um, we've been wrestling with that first one a bit um, over the past few months. It's remarkably difficult to do, especially when, you're, when you should know what you're talking about when you're running a grave goods project. Um, and the second question is um, that we'd like to, we're asking whether we can move, and hopefully the answer to this is yes, from an impressionistic or an assumed understanding of change through time and prehistory to a, a real and informed one, and hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll bring out in a bit more detail in a minute what I, what I mean by that. So um, what I do mean by that question um, is up on the picture in, in visual form um, is that impressionistic understanding of burial and how grave goods come into that sequence. So we know that in the Neolithic grave goods are, in, in Britain, grave goods are relatively uncommon. Um, the primary focus of mortuary practice arguably was um, the deposition of human bodies and then the, the intermingling and removal of some, that kind of idea. Um, then the story goes that we're not quite sure what happens after the early Neolithic in many places, but in the early Bronze Age, as you can see with that beaker burial, um, we see a, a, a flourishing of grave goods and of the visibility um, of burial practice and grave goods being caught up amongst them as exemplified by that, that beaker um, right in the centre of that photo. Um, then towards the latter part stages of the Bronze Age, um, grave goods become slightly less um, impressive arguably, or at least that's been the narrative that's been told, um, until we get into the Iron Age, which is a confusing narrative of burial and grave goods to tell, because um, different regions come in and out of focus, and different things happen through time in a, in, a, in a not entirely coherent but nonetheless extremely interesting manner. So that's the, um, the, the, the overall story that, that m many if, if not all of the people in the room will have in their minds already. Um, and in order to try and encapsulate that, at the beginning of the project we sat down as a team and drew a squiggly graph to represent that. So hopefully you can see um, the caption down the bottom um, in terms of we're talking in the different lines of number of burials, um, number of grave goods, and the variety of object types. So you can see clearly lots of burial in the early Neolithic, 
a big peak in the early Bronze Age and then another great big peak um, as we move into the late Iron Age. So I, I need to emphasise at this point that that is us sketching an impression at the beginning of the project. So hopefully that's the kind of impression that, that people that are interested in engaged with later prehistoric graves goods in this room would also have approximately drawn, okay? And I'll, we'll come back to that graph um, in a little bit. So that's the impressionistic understanding of change that we had at the start of the project. And in order to move away from that impressionistic understanding of change, um, what we wanted to do was essentially make sure that we could build that understanding and, and create that graph on an actual empirical knowledge of what goes in grave goods. Um, and we wanted to do that um, throughout, but from the very start of um, Mel and I discussing the project, we wanted to do it as a long-term thing <coughs> to try and encapsulate the ebbs and flows of practice through over that, the course of 4,000 odd years. Um, but we knew that we couldn't, you know, ideally we'd have liked to build a database of every single grave good across Britain throughout that period, but we knew that was um, logistically impossible. So, um, in the end, what we decided on was to focus on six key case study regions um, <coughs> that you can see. Um, and this is a very, it was a difficult process to, to, to go through because you had to decide what was going to stand for the whole country. But, but overriding our, our desire to know everything was our desire to encapsulate all of the material culture because that concept lay at the, the, the core of the project from the start. So you can see that we've selected the Outer Hebrides in Orkney, um, East Yorkshire, Gwynedd and Anglesey, Cornwall and Scilly, Dorset and Kent as our, our case study regions. We also had, I could go on for a while about the, the, the process through which we chose them, but key to that choosing process was the need to really have quite good burial records throughout that period because it would be um, perhaps a more representative story if you chose a less vibrant re region in terms of grave goods, but it would perhaps be arguably be a less interesting story as well. So through that, those case study regions, they were coming to stand for national trends. Um, in doing that, we could look at regional patterns of similarity and difference, at least in the regions that, that we're looking at in depth. Um, and it, another part of the process, which has been very important to the project, is the process of creating that data, which has been a more lengthy one than we would have liked, inevitably, um, has brought out lots of um, um, information and ideas that only come about through engaging in that da data in detail. Um, and as we, we finish the data, we finish the data construction process now, and then we move forwards into the, um, we're already moving forwards um, into the more rich textured narratives. It's been that process of data gathering that's enabled us to know the, the next step and the next things that we're interested in, essentially. Um, so, as I've said already, hinted at already, our, our aim has been to focus on the entire material assembly caught up in burial, not just the fancy stuff, as you might call it. Um, we want to draw out long-term term trends um, and shift the focus away from the peaks of the graphs from the early Bronze Age or the late Iron Age to those other phases within our study period that are perhaps less prominent in narratives and make them, give them equal prominence um, so that we can compare the different the peaks in the different periods. So some of the themes, the theoretical interpretive themes that are in the background of the idea to, um, to, to do this project were thinking about object and human biographies, material agency and meaning, so the power of objects and the way in which we can try and get to their meaning how objects come to be caught up in, the, in death and the emotions surrounding that. Um, the notion, um, the long made um, link between wealth and status and objects has come under a lot of scrutiny over the past 20 years, I guess you could say. Um, that was one of the things that we were keen to take forward and investigate further and the critique of that. And as I've said, to look at the small things as well as the fancy ones. Um, so in terms of what the project's going to produce, um, it's going to produce a database of all of the grave goods in those areas. Two papers um, that we're making good progress on at the moment. Um, one's going to be about um, containment and wrapping in burial um, in a variety of different perspectives. And the other's going to be 
um, investigating the deposition of grave goods as part of the much wider spectrum of depositional practice, um, including hoards and other ritual deposits. Because once you, we've, we've come to realise, whilst conducting a project about grave goods, that once you start to look in detail at those grave, it's hard, quite hard to start to, to actually define what's a grave, and then it's quite hard to sometimes to see where a grave and the deposition of human bones stops and a hoard or a structured deposit in a pit ends. So um, we're looking at that um, in the second paper. We're going to produce a book um, about the project, summarising all of the other results and lots of it, um, nice things. Um, we've already had our academic conference um, in Manchester earlier this year, um, and we've got a more public um, focus conference coming up um, in the British Museum um, next May. In terms of the project's um, wider impact, as we call it, um, we're doing various things, including um, creating um, teaching packs about prehistoric archaeology in general, but focused through bur burial, um, which are going to contain poems written by the um, ex-children's laureate and internationally famous, really, um, poet Michael Rosen, as he's appearing in that photo. Um, a character and he's produced some great poems for us which has been fantastic as well as a series of reconstruction images um, taking different forms created by three different artists um, we've got a visualisation of the database that you can see down the bottom there um, so that people can engage with the sites that we've put into our database um, in a public facing website as well as a much more substantial um, database which will end up with the archaeology data service um, and we'll be reintegrating the data that we've now enhanced through the process of creating the database automatically, um, we hope, back into historic environment records um, so that um, as um, archaeology as a whole and the, the statutory records that are, exist of it will have been enhanced by our research in a genuine and meaningful way. So rather than having a, a separate database, a lot of that data will be incorporating, incorporated back into the AGRs at that fundamental primary point of contact that researchers and um, practitioners have with the record. Um, I take a while to ponder those pictures. Up the top is the Egyptian gallery, down the bottom are the prehistoric galleries. And Neil chose those images of the British Museum. Um, but you'll notice the rather, and I know they're slightly not staged, but chosen carefully, um, but in, in a very real sense. Um, the Egyptian galleries and, and the grave goods within them um, see in, intense focus of um, interest and activity, the later prehistoric ones perhaps less so. So we're going to be um, enhancing some of the key displays um, in that gallery with some of the knowledge created through the project and just a general sprucing up of key grave goods within the gallery. Um, and we're also going to be constructing a grave goods trail around the British Museum um, building on the kind of concept that everyone will know um, from the history of the world and a hundred objects. It won't quite be a history of the world and a hundred grave goods, but you get the idea that people will be able to follow um, a trail, a themed trail around the museum that's focused on grave goods. As you can imagine, substantial numbers of the objects on display in the British Museum are, of course, grave goods. Um, so that's the, the project in outline. Um, I'm going to give you a, a broad scale sum summary of the results so far, and then Mel will take you into a more textured um, um, investigation into grave goods in the second part. Um, so that's the um, numbers, so over 1,000 sites, nearly 3,000 graves, over 3,000 burials, and nearly 6,000 um, objects are included in, in the database, and you can see dense red dots of sites in the key case study regions. So a lot of data to work with and a lot of objects to think about, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, so of course, as I've said, it's important to bear in mind some caveats. Um, we're doing it in six case study regions, not everything, so you can't produce nice national scale um, plots of what, what finds are where. Um, but that, that, that cost has come with benefits of uh, um, much more detailed um, knowledge and analysis in other areas. We haven't been able to include all burials um, in our database. We've only included the ones with grave goods, because that would have involved a whole different level of 
um, engagement and recording of the data, it's too much, although ideally we would have liked to have done that. Um, we've included all the formal burials, but that's complicated to define, and um, hopefully Mel and I will be able to pass the definition of formal burials on to Amman and Trina maybe when it comes to writing the book, because it's a complicated one, because there are very blurred edges um, to deal with, but you have to deal with it in a, in a rational way that we, we will be able to explain. But it's been, it's been tricky, um, as has the Neolithic, um, he can say, having worked quite a lot in the Neolithic over the course of the past few years, but it has been di difficult to handle because the, think back to the beaker burial, you've got a nice grave and you've got a beaker and some daggers and they're all within a confined grave and a coherent body. But in the Neolithic, you're getting a much looser relationship between the material and the body and the individuals. You're getting um, tombs into which people come in and out. So not only do you have fewer grave goods, you also have a much looser relationship between the um, the, the, the people buried in there and the objects that ended up in that tomb. And that's a difficult one to deal with because we don't want to, it's, it, is, it is very interesting which objects end up in Neolithic tombs, but it's very difficult to tie those objects often to people. And ultimately this project is really about that. So the Neolithic doesn't quite work in the same way as other periods. Um, but we can't just ignore the Neolithic, but it has been a tricky one to, to deal with. Um, so back to that graph, um, in terms of broad scale results, that's the one I showed you a minute ago, um, and that is the one that we've now been able to create on the basis of all of that data that I showed you a minute ago. And it, 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 again, it's a slight fabrication because um, on the, on the y-axis I've had to sort of score um, actual empirical data out of giving it marks out of 100 because obviously burials and great numbers of grave goods and variety of object types aren't um, straightforwardly comparable. Um, but you can see um, if I put up the kind of annotations, I hope you can read the, the, the text, it doesn't really matter if you can't. The number of burials in the early Neolithic is not as high as we expected. Um, hopefully you can see up the top there um, that blue line in terms of the number of burials has extended much further into the middle and towards the later Bronze Age than we expected. So you're keeping the high number of burials um, into the middle Bronze Age, but as you can see with the variety of object types and the number of gate goods, that drops prior to that. So you've got um, a different, unexpected relationship in terms of numbers of burials versus number of grave goods. Um, as you go down the bottom there, the extent of the loneliness, I'm sorry that seems like an ugly word, but I couldn't think of a better word, um, of the late Bronze and early Iron Age in those two categories of numbers of burials and numbers of um, grave goods, remembering that we've only recorded burials with grave goods. Um, and then the extent of the, the, the height of, um, of the late Iron Age, basically, was perhaps surprising and not quite, it was higher than perhaps we expected. So that's the, 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 the wiggly graph on the basis of empirical information. So no, no significant changes because, of course, we knew what we knew, what we, what we had a rough idea of was based on evidence, so it's not going to dramatically transform it. But it can become nuanced and it can become um, empirically based rather than imagined. Um, hopefully you can see these um, graphs. So just a few um, 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 interesting patterns to bring out. So you probably can't completely see because the font's very small down the bottom, but we've divided our data into time slices of 100 <coughs> years. Um, so early Neolithic is on the left and um, first century AD is on the right. And there you can see, um, as you'd imagine, objects starting to take off. Um, and this is raw numbers of objects compared to um, raw numbers of graves. And you can see that peak um, in the middle, in the early and, and middle Bronze Age, and then that dramatic drop and then the rise. So we were able to chart these kind of patterns through time um, really nicely. You can see that they're broadly echoing one another, but there, are, there is the, the, the difference between the objects and the graves extends as you get more, more of it going on. So that, that the, patterns, the, 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 width, the, the, the distance between those lines gets ex accentuated at times of uh, peaks on the graph. Um, this is another pattern that we would have expected, but we can actually um, uh, report it and, and, and represent it empirically. So we know that 
Um, we have a peak of inhumation slightly earlier in the early Bronze Age and then cremation takes over. But through the time slice approach and the, the large scale of data collection that we've done, you can actually graph that empirically and you can see um, inhumation dropping off and cremation really taking off into the late Bronze Age and then that pattern swapping over again in the late Iron Age. Um, so at the moment, it will be great to, when we come to write about these things in the long term. But at the moment, it's just hopefully impressive that we're able to, to um, represent that in those kind of patterns empirically. Um, another interesting graph, we, we all kind of, again, expected um, the early Bronze Age. It's, 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 it's quite well established that um, male graves are, especially in the early part of that, are often the ones that are... Um, that contain grave goods and that are richly um, represented in terms of material culture. Perhaps surprising that the female part of the graph, according to traditional narratives, is so close to the male in that part. And then you can see broadly following each other until, really interestingly, in the late Iron Age, the number of female burials actually um, is much greater than the male in the late Iron Age, which is not a pattern that anyone, as far as I know, um, has been able to demonstrate or has thought about previously. And that's very interesting in itself as well. Of course, these are patterns that are in case of where we can set the burials. Um, there you can see the number of materials, so that's like being things like copper and, and pot and tin, um, and you know what I mean, <laughs> um, and the types of objects. And you can see, again, an accentuation um, of the time when you get more materials you get even more object types, or perhaps, I should say it the other way around, when you get loads of different object types, they tend to be made in, in lots of different materials. So again, you can see a close mirroring, but then accentuation of the peaks, a bit like we saw um, with the burials. And the other kind of thing we can do um, is graph uh, how, what proportion of grave goods pots make up of all, all grave goods. And when we created that graph, in a way, the surprising thing was how how constant and even it was through time. Um, so you can see the little holes um, and, we can, and quite a large um, um, drop in the, towards the middle and late Iron Age, but otherwise, in a way, relatively constant proportion um, through that period of all grave goods pots are, are representing. Um, and that's a um, slightly tricky graph to um, explain, but this is the, the mean um, numbers of grave goods and the dots represent the outliers in the statistical um, spread of numbers of grave goods. So through that kind of graphic representation, you can start to see that you get some graves in the early Bronze Age and the middle and late Iron Age with loads and loads of disproportionately um, numbers of graves. So you can begin to think about hierarchy, at least in terms of uh, numbers of grave goods, rather than necessarily social hierarchy through the statistical analysis of the, of the data that we've collected. Um, so I think um, just to come to a close with the broad scale patterning, um, it's very important empirical basis on which to build. Um, it's tricky with the dots on the maps because they are um, in regions and so you, you can't bring out that nationwide pattern. So you have to stop thinking in that way and I think in a, in a way our natural inclination as archaeologists is to think in, in terms of distribution maps that our distribution map is a, a false one because they're all separated regions. You can't um, join up the two. But as I said earlier, the macro scale patterning that, that, that we've been able to um, 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 interrogate um, play, does place us on a firm basis on which to move on and to build interpretations um, about grave goods. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Mel. Give us some water then. I'll Thank you. Now Duncan's done the hard work with the, the database and the statistics, it's my job to try and offer a few thoughts about where the project is taking us conceptually. And um, to do that, we wanted to go back to some of our earliest definitions. The very term grave goods, we, we're trying to track when that emerges in the literature, and our first accounts uh, where that's used as a, an actual concept seem to date to the 1880s, um, and it's this definition at the moment, although we are always uh, ready and willing to accept new ones, where that seems to be used in, in this very specific manner to describe uh, a range of objects that are listed that are found with the dead. However, I had the great privilege uh, a few weeks ago of being shown a first edition 
of Sir Thomas Brown's um, Hydrotophia, which is one of the first intellectual considerations of why things are placed with the dead. And so, although Brown doesn't use the word grave goods, I think he captures very poetically and vividly some of the motivations that might lie behind the inclusion of objects in burials, which I think I'm still going to find it hard to trump um, in the final volume. Of course, when we deal with antiquarianism, we're dealing with a set of ideas about those objects which immediately leaps to um, ideas about identity. So when we're dealing with, uh, these are my, some, two of my favorite antiquarians, uh, Mortimer, of course, and uh, Ken uh, Greenwell, uh, who worked in the area that I know best, in East Yorkshire, um, their curiosity about those grave goods lies not so much in the objects and material types, although they are writing about those, of course, as to what they tell us about the racial history of Britain. <coughs> and uh, there's quite a difference of opinion being uh, debated between these two authors, who were, of course, uh, considerable rivals, and they did finally collaborate on Dane's Graves' excavations together. Um, but through the contrast of comparison of their grave goods, um, they have quite different ideas about how to inter the, interpret them in terms of racial identity. So for Mortimer, he was quite uncomplicated about it, um, particularly in relation to the Iron Age material. You have a new technology, the chariots, you have a new way of working metal, iron working, you have new art styles, which are more complicated and sophisticated. This, to him, indicates that higher state of civilization, a more progressive and accomplished people invading East Yorkshire from the continent. But both of these authors are using craniology in relation to that material culture. And that puzzles them, because when they excavate den graves, they don't find any weapons. And to both of them, that poses a real puzzle as to whether this is actually an invading race. Um, Greenwell is very influenced by the work of the Reverend Moore Cole, who, who persuades him that because there are no weapons in these graves, this is a peaceable people, this is a settled population. And he therefore uses his craniology reports to argue you're looking at the results of inbreeding between the Neolithic and Bronze Age populations, and what you're seeing is the result of that fusion um, expressed both in the burial rites, the human remains, and the material culture. Um, uh, he obviously overlooks some of Wright's thoughts in those craniology reports, um, but for Mortimer, he's using Garson's report to talk about this much more racially pure group, and he links that to the objects like the uh, fibulae styles, and the pottery, um, the metalwork. And by the end of his life in 1911, he's, uh, he's, he's decided that even, even these incomers are not particularly impressive, so waifs and strays from across the ocean, bringing in these new ideologies about burial alongside those um, grave goods. Of course, by the time we get to the 1930s, 1940s, we, we've moved away from using the word race, but there is an implicit idea that new burial rites, new suites of grave goods are allied to a new people, the Wessex culture, beaker folk, and here we can see Piggott's ideas about this um, delightful barbaric finery, which nonetheless led them to con uh, conquer this uninteresting and unenterprising substratum. So we've still got this alliance between objects as indicators of, of people's character and ethnic origin and a physical origin and the way in which they're expressing themselves in death, um, seen as very much an expression of their life. And we might think we've moved away from that, and, I, and I'm quite glad Neil's not here tonight, um, but of course one of our tasks is to think critically about our third partner in the project, the British Museum, and how we're telling that story to the public. And so I went around the labels on the cases, and this is what you will read. In those labels, and of course Neil's not so responsible for this, nor is Julia Farley, our lovely Iron Age curator, these are labels that were written some time ago, but still within their, um, uh, the way in which they're describing those objects, those narratives that, if we're not going to talk about ethnic identity or race, we can at least talk about status. Um, that the notion is that there is an uncomplicated relationship here between what people place for the dead and their identity in life. So rich burials are signs of high status, elite identity, importance, and they are ways in which when we look at Duncan's Peaks, we can spot moments when society becomes more complicated, more stratified, and that that is expressed in death through the things one is buried with. Now, there are more subtle stories, of course, to tell, um, and I always feel I'm treading very much, uh, hopefully very respectfully, in the footsteps of the instead, when I'm in the British Museum and in my research in the field. 
And, and some of, I think, the more subtle interpretations here belong to him. So when he's talking about Mill Hill Deal, he is trying to unpick you know, what is that crown about on, the, on that skull. It's a sign of leadership, but is this spiritual, is this military, is it political? Um, so he's complicating some of those ideas. So there is subtlety there, but arguably our job is to bring more subtlety out of those interpretations of the objects themselves. And to remember, you know, I was a student of Mike Parker Pearson's at, at Sheffield University, and he, this was how he used to start his funerary archaeology courses with that quote from Edmund Leach, reminding us that we are dealing with death. These people have died. This is a funeral. <coughs> and because it is, it may be willed by the deceased, but it is orchestrated by the living, this is a political moment, a moment when identity changes, um, a moment when people reorganise their own position in society, and when they are dealing with the emotions around death and loss itself. So the notion that some of these things might be gifts, some of them to do with the funerary performance itself, um, and some of the emotions that surround that, that is something that we want to bring out more richly in our accounts. So I'm going to now just discuss a few themes that we're going to be working with in terms of looking again at some of those object classes. What do the dead need? When they are recently deceased, they still have a bond with us that is very physical. They need us to do things for them. They need us to perhaps wash them, dress them, um, and that might include fine clothing or favourite clothing or new clothing or old clothing. We might prepare their bodies in various ways with cosmetics. We might pluck their hair. Um, we might um, cut off our own hair and lay it in the grave. We've got a, a lovely example of, I think, of that, I think, at the uh, Amesbury Arch Fair. And we need to perhaps wrap the body or contain it in a coffin or cremate it and put it in a pot or a bowl. And so some of the grave goods we are interpreting in our burials, in East Yorkshire, in the Iron Age burials, we find brooches behind the head or by the knees or the heels. These aren't objects worn on a cloak as in life. They are wrapping a shroud around the body. And so we need to see them as part of that funeral performance. They may well be old objects that were uh, fond uh, tokens of these people, but in this context, they're also being used to perform a funeral function. Um, so we're trying to think about that, that moment of tenderness and care, ongoing concern that the dead require from the living because this is the last set of bonds that you will perform for them. And if you really do think the dead have agency, and there is an eye afterlife, and they can come back and haunt you, then those acts really matter in terms of how the dead then treat you from that uh, other side of the spiritual realm. And to do that, we're also drawing on some anthropology and sociology about uh, funerary rites and about dressing the dead. So this is a quote from a lovely article by Catherine Harper that talks about um, the moment when she's encouraged to bring uh, her father's glasses, um, to put them on him. And um, uh, the quote she has from one of her anthropological <coughs> interviews is about the fact that the, the very act of putting the glasses back on somebody who habitually wore them humanises the dead, makes them look like themselves. So you mustn't forget that part of what you're orchestrating here is a narrative and a story about that individual, which is partly for the benefit of the mourners themselves. Uh, one of the articles that continues to inspire us is Joanna Brooks' lovely um, article about the ties that bind. So if we're dealing with uh, beautifully rich burials like the White Horse Hill Cairn, early Bronze Age burial on Dartmoor, cremation wrapped in a bare skin with um, a nettle fibre garment, high fringe, delicate bracelet woven from cattle hair, studded with tin beads, the basketry, the ear loops, the necklace of composite objects. What we can see in this range of grave goods is not what we might have otherwise classed as a very fancy elite burial, but a burial that encapsulates the wealth of that community, um, the relationships this woman might have embodied, and the many uh, donations of things or substances that made her what she was. And so we're trying to kind of pull out of, even though some of those more mundane objects, that scale of relationships which might be brought to, to bear at the moment of that send-off, that final farewell. And part of this bringing of things for the dead, um, so whether these are gifts or personal possessions, may well be that, that comfort the dead is being given, that they are still part of a community. And this is another quote from, from Harper's article about why people in contemporary society put photographs of the living around the dead and the sense that that company that is provided for the deceased reminds them of the living connections, the memories that they'll still be held in. 
So that sense of people gifting things around our prehistoric bodies may well be part of that reassurance that they are still part of that community, part of that network. Yet we're not going to dismiss the idea that some of our burials tell very personal stories through those objects about the life that somebody has lived. This is Chariot Burial 1 from Wetland Slack, uh, where we have a disassembled chariot, a lovely set of spearheads and a beautiful Iron Age sword. Um, and this is an individual who has certainly had a colourful life. Um, the skull you can see on the bottom left has a slice taken off it with an Iron Age sword, and the bone is knit back together, but that is a real hole in his head. And he lived with that for many years beyond, his, uh, beyond the, the injury. And so this is an individual who's probably quite changed by that accident, probably thought of as quite uh, extraordinary. There's no sign of infection there, extraordinary testimony to the medical care. And perhaps his send-off is an absolutely fitting, martial kind of send-off for this individual that is in keeping with the life and the experiences this person has lived. But sometimes we see objects that are literally pieced together for the funeral itself. Here's another chariot burial, this time from West Yorkshire, an outlier from the main tradition, probably an area of Yorkshire where they're not completely familiar with how to do this. And here we have a vehicle that is literally put together out of old bits. So the wheels are old, they're a mismatched pair, they've seen a lot of action trundling around, but they don't belong together. They're of a different kind of circumference, and one is decorated and one is not. So somebody has clearly kind of bought one wheel, somebody else has bought another wheel. Nobody has any turrets, so they make those fresh. They're complete shams, they're little thin bits of bronze around a clay core, and the excavators say if you've done more than wheel this to the graveside, it would have fallen apart. So some things are freshly made for the dead. And presumably this is because probably this individual was from Holderness and said, when I, when I go, give me a chariot burial. And they're improvising a little with what's for hand and making new ones for the deceased. But the crafting of new things for the dead is a common theme that's coming out of many of our examples. And that moment of crafting something new, of course, is redolent with the symbolism of new life, of new possibilities, and perhaps even new identity. Um, he may not be a chariot driver. This may be a complete fiction. Um, but at the moment of death, he's being constructed with this glorious send-off. Um, when people give gifts, of course, they may be settling old debts, but they may also be creating new obligations, reminding us of that strategic capital of the dead themselves. And one of the things we're coming across in our accounts of some of those freshly made objects <coughs> is that we see sloppy or imperfect objects hastily made, and often when we read the account of that, it's, well, you know, the dead won't notice. It's just, just for the funeral, so we can get away with something not being quite right, um, second rate, perhaps, or non-functional. And that may well be the case. Um, but in talking to our colleagues in, um, uh, in other domains, such as um, uh, mortuary care, uh, palliative care for the dead, um, we think that has a deeper meaning, which I'll come to in a moment. So one of the things we're, we're interested in is the way in which you use the burial itself to create a powerful ancestor figure, as Richard Jenkins reminds us, not even death can seal the, the picture, there is that post-mortem revision of identity. Um, so when we see our glorious late Iron Age burials, constructing concepts of, of, of kingship and authority, is this something that, that this individual lived through in life, or is death itself the moment where those new ideas are powerfully repeated for the community? And many years ago, Brinsall pointed out that there is, it's a curious thing when you get objects that are implying some sense of agency in the afterlife. So when you have both the means of making fire and the materials to do so, or as Anne Wood and John Hunter point out, daggers and whetstones, which imply a sense of the resharpening of a blade that has yet to come. So we can look to our grave goods um, for some insight into whether there was a concept of agency in the afterlife and roles that had yet to be fulfilled. The dead share in that funeral performance itself. And one of the other themes our project is looking at is the importance of food within um, uh, the graves. For example, he instead draws a distinction in his volume between grave goods, which he argues are personal possessions found on the body, and grave gifts, which for him basically means joints of meat. Um, and normally that's the left uh, humerus of lamb, a leg of lamb in a pot for the average burial, but for chariot burials and sword burials, it's pork. Um, and I was particularly struck when reviewing the, the wonderful uh, volume on the Edge by this quote about 19th century Cheshire, um, where there is a, um, a count of a special cake that people eat at a wake, 
and it's wrapped in rosemary, and that rosemary is either tossed into the grave um, or actually placed in the coffin itself. So something fragrant that's been wrapped around something you consume, but it's part of one, and part of it is given to the dead, and part of it is consumed by the mourners. So that notion of sharing in the performance is important. And one of the colleagues we've been talking to in an ongoing conversation between our projects is Karina Croucher from Bradford University. And on her continuing bonds project, she's been working with palliative care teams to look at the way in which they negotiate death with, uh, with families, um, with people who, who are aware that they are uh, going to die. And one of the things that's coming out of her work is the importance of crafting as a process that happens in the last few weeks of life, or things that are made in memory of the recently deceased. And Alex Gibson had argued quite some time ago that um, the little pots that we sometimes find in early Bronze Age burials, the pygmy pots, are particularly kind of poorly made, some of them. And we are wondering whether there's not something going on here in terms of some of those sloppily made objects, where we're looking at objects either made by the mourners that are deliberately badly made as signs of grief, perhaps. And your gift to the dead expresses that confusion and kind of mourning period. Or perhaps they are literally made by the dead themselves as a powerful thing to engage in in those last few weeks of life. Some of our other burials have quite a different feel to them, um, and this is particularly the case in some of my uh, weapons burials in East Yorkshire, but also in Kent and in Dorset, where we find quite a lot of fury, anger, and, and drama at the grave site. Um, so we find swords bent or snapped or folded, shields as in Mill Hill Deal folded in half, we can imagine the wood splintering and cracking, Almost famously in East Yorkshire, the speared burials, where we can tell from the fill of the grave that a cohort of, of young people, probably, I would imagine, are stood around the grave, casting spears into the grave fill as it goes in. And some of the spearheads, as at Garden Station 10, end up in the corpse itself. Some of them splinter through the shield and stick out of the grave dramatically. And we know that those shafts are not pulled out. So the spear, spears end up like bristles or spines poking out of the burial mound. And this is, I think, what we could see as a kind of a, a martial send-off, a gun salute for usually a young man who has died at an untimely age. And of course, we know that grief and anger are part of the emotions we often experience in the mourning process. And for a lovely kind of discussion of that, um, given that one of the audiences we're working with are uh, school-aged children, uh, we've been using a monster caused by Patrick Ness, where uh, destruction, violence, and grief are, are, are worked through in very visually kind of and, and, and textually engaging ways. So these are things we want to bring out from our dramatic case studies as well. That drama, that violence that can happen to objects almost as a surrogate for the body itself. Sometimes death is appalling. It is devastating. We're dealing with agricultural communities by and large. And when that's a double death, as in case six, a woman who dies in childbirth, that's especially atrocious for them, the loss of two lives. And so with some of our other smaller objects, we're trying to think of the way in which those bad deaths um, might be dealt with through special kinds of objects. Um, so substances like jet and amber, which and Woodward has long argued have very special powers and properties that are probably drawn on both symbolically and uh, probably real magical practice in the early Bronze Age, that the wrapping of a body or surrounding it with amulets, like this little bronze um, disc, usually found as a fertility charm on the continent, but here perhaps on a garment or part of the wrapping around the head, um, that these might be ways in which you use objects to negotiate a particularly um, difficult death. And as Block and Parry reminds us, there's nothing you fear more than a revenant. So when death is difficult, objects are part of how you negotiate, how you charm the deceased into taking the next step into the other world. And sometimes the dead don't go alone. Um, this is the so-called sinful couple, excavated by Brewster back in the 1980s, of a, of a man and a woman buried together, staked through the wrist and the elbow. And for Tony Brewster, what he thought he was seeing was evidence of an illicit affair, because the woman has once again died around the time of uh, childbirth. But another way of reading this is that we're seeing the creation in death of an eternal couple. We don't often use ideas about um, assisted suicide or people deciding to part together in, in, in the world, but if this man has lost his uh, wife and child, partner and child, perhaps he decides that they shouldn't go alone into that afterlife. 
We're perhaps more familiar with thinking about uh, animals in burials as perhaps companions for the dead. And this was the little set of notes that I found in my own copy of Mortimer's 1905 article drawing my attention to the fact that dog's heads are found with infant burials. And the author, I don't know who they were, simply wrote in brackets, souls are not lost with dogs. And that sense that there are some <coughs> vulnerable dead who need companionship, whether that's an animal or whether that's a special object, like our folks and drums with our young child, companionship, helping hands, as my Egyptology colleagues call it. And that's another theme we're going to be looking for. So I just want to close with a bit of a local story. Um, in the BBC uh, of Manchester, they reported on a, a set of uh, incidents that had happened in Bolton Crematorium. Um, most notoriously, a coconut had been slipped into a coffin, and when it had gone into the crematorium, it exploded very violently, uh, causing uh, real fear uh, amongst the crematorium assistants. And so they issued a set of guidance um, uh, asking people to refrain from placing the following items into the coffin, which included a list that you can see there, golf clubs, whiskey, mobile phones, television handsets, love letters, e-cigarettes, bikers' letters, apparently said, well, of course, we couldn't let them put those in. I don't see any reason why not, but maybe they have a combustible property, I don't know. Um, uh, but what fascinated us as a Grey Goods team is none of this is a surprise to us. The, the urge to bury things with the dead is still there with us. And the, and the crematorium team said, people have got so sneaky, they know we go through the coffin, they're slitting the lining and stuffing it into the lining of the coffin. And so these things are still causing problems for, uh, for the, the mortuary care teams. But prehistory tells us this is a very human sentiment. Um, libations for the dead, uh, things that give them pleasure or leisure in the afterlife, fond affections, um, messages that you never got to deliver. These are all things we think we can see in our objects. Um, of course, our, my classical colleagues uh, would uh, point also to the tokens, the symbols like um, the opal as a way of earning passage. If you think of death as a uh, journey into the afterlife, you may need a coin or a token to earn passage into that afterlife. We're not dealing with an era um, until the very latest Iron Age that has coinage, but we're going to be looking to see whether we have any symbols or equivalents. Um, and one of my lovely undergraduate students, uh, just to end our, our piece, um, found uh, that one of the people she interviewed at the crematorium had slipped a 20 pound note in somebody's breast pocket. And when she asked him why he'd done it, he said, oh, you know, it's, um, it's a latch lifter. He said, what? He said, well, you know, to, to bribe, say, Peter, the gate, you know, to get in. And so there's a complete Manchester club mentality that you give the doorman a bribe and you get in. Um, but he was using a term, a latch lifter, that is very ancient, you know, I doubt he knew what a latch was. So we hope that our project has things to teach ourselves about what we do, um, uh, and that from prehistory we we'll gain those insights through that conversation between past and present. Thank you.